So you must be curious about what my staph infection looks like, and I'm showing you uh, my feet, my legs, <laughs> you can see. Um, well, it's not the end of the world, I got them all bandaged up, uh, but you know, <laughs> they are what they are. So, um, it's been about a month or, or two that I've had to have it bandages and as you can see I've lost my sense of balance a bit uh, I'm going to sit down there so I showed you my legs we've got Sarah Sleen playing way in the background um, but that's okay. Uh, this is Juno weekend in Canada, so there's a lot going on musically. And that's exciting, because as it happens, there's a lot of amazing Canadian music out there, and I'm deeply impressed and somewhat intimidated uh, by the level of proficiency that these artists are demonstrating. Man, they've really got something going. And it's, it's exciting to watch. So I'm eating a, a, a calcium antacid here because they're tasty and I enjoy it. I shouldn't be because I'm on camera, but you know, <laughs> those, them's the breaks. At the moment, uh, I'm suffering. You, you don't see it. But man, I'm in intense pain because of these bloody legs. And you have no idea, but this is like 9, 10 level pain. It's laughable. Uh, because it does interfere with my ability to speak. Uh, you know, it's that, it's that painful. And yeah, it's kind of funny to contemplate, but boy, what a pain. But I sort of endure it, right? Uh, in order to communicate or to send you a message. And I shall continue to try to do so. <laughs> so long as I have something to say, and I'm doubting whether I do at the moment and uh, contemporary geopolitics of what is there to say. We're in a bit of a wreck right now. The Windsor family seems to be under attack. And, um, you know, for me, it's been weeks of this. And I think about it and I say, well, you don't really look that bad. Um, your tone is good and your appetite is fine. Uh, your even gaining a bit of weight, although I am still very, very thin. Hmm? So, again, I think we're bad sound, I've turned it off, and that's not a criticism of Sarah Sleen, if anything, it's a criticism of the residual distortions that I'm getting out of my system at the moment. Now, I'll grant you, this little mini system that I got here sounds unlike anything you've ever heard. I don't know if I could do better with the quad electrostatics. I certainly couldn't fit them into this office. You know, it's a downstairs studio for you. But I do plan to design some sound gardens for, you know, multi-channel sound, so to speak. Now, everything is derived from a stereo signal. It's just what I do with that signal afterward that counts, right? I split it up, I parse it out, I subdivide it, I dissect it with the studio gear. So I can do that downstairs. I can have multiple speaker setups. I've got three quad electrostatics, left, right, different signal, and I've got plenty of mission uh, dynamic driver loudspeakers that I can position around uh, that produce some combination of the main signal and the difference depending on where they're situated in the room. So I will create something that should sound quite spectacular at lower volume levels. The immersive experience would be tremendous. And I like to do stuff like that. Uh, to demonstrate to people why well, you can make a system that sounds this good. Uh, this could cost you about 20 grand for the speakers alone. Uh, but, um, and, you know, the amplification will be complicated because you're going to need a lot of amplifiers because every uh, part of the chain needs to be separately amplified for this kind of stuff to work. So for the different signal, you need two 
for one speaker. You need two amplifiers because you've got to have the left channel and the right channel so that you can pick up those signals and use that to create the different signals. So you need a separate amplifier for that. Or, of course, you could wire everything off of one. Uh, but I tend to go with separate amplifiers because you can adjust the volume very precisely and zone in on that. You can just sit with your audio palette adjusting various levels uh, to produce sound in various corners and you can just dial it in. For your listener who's in front of you and man, they're having an immersive experience and you're working with controls. So I've done that quite often uh, to give people a sense of what is within their music. Because I like to do that because you can zero in and by the way, these are all the subjective distortions. And then adjust the control so that is basically all you hear is the subject of sources and that freaks people out when they hear it because they go, well, that's not supposed to be in a recording. Well, I'd say you can extract it right out again, right? You can do that. You take the subjective distortions, put them in a separate track and then use that as something that you're going to pull those subjective distortions that are in the main channel. You're going to suppress them with your signal that is just subjective distortions. That's how you remove them is by putting an inverted one in and basically it wipes everything off. Uh, but you have to come up with a signal in the first place and that takes work. Most studios don't even contemplate such things. They don't have the equipment for it for one thing. They don't understand the equipment for another thing. And the third thing is, you know, if you give them something like that as a tool, they're going to look at it and go, well, what can I do with this? Without realizing that they can remove subjective distortions by this method. And that's not a particularly clever studio, by the way. He really should be in a better place. But most studios are like that. And certainly uh, at the turn of the millennium, most of them were like that because you could do nothing uh, but you know, what they were set up for. And I thought, that's insane. Because I'd often start my recordings of music on the Revox, build up a layer of sound uh, bouncing tracks and then then moving to stereo I might take those bounce tracks and convert it to two left and right tracks and work on them for a while and then combine them into a complete channel at a later point and then work on the complete channel thing but generally that would be the last step where I'd combine those channels and then they're in one and that's seamless because you really can't detect it, but what you get is a wall of sound. And the left and right channels are quite distinct, but also totally uh, connected to one another because they start with the same basic bed track in both channels, so that locks it in. And then you've got all the variances that take place in the left and right channel, which you've done to those channels separately, in mono, by the way, and then you put it in stereo at the very end. That's a very effective way to work because one thing you can do is you can always control the noise. So you can produce something at the end which sounds, you know, that's kind of noise free. That's really incredible how we did that. Well, it didn't take much work in retrospect. Uh, the other thing about recording for me is it's very fast. I'll start the day with the aim of producing, say, three songs, recording and finishing three songs. That's everything, including the vocals. Uh, and I'll probably pull it off easily for a whole day. It only takes about an hour or two to work on and create a piece of music from start to finish. That's as long as it takes. It's not a big process for me. Uh, so I'm whipping out these songs left, right, and center, right? And it's been like this for years, because you know, I used the same methodology when I started out, and I didn't change it, I didn't really see any reason to. So every sophisticated, complex technique that I use now uh, was available to me then, and you better believe I exploited it uh, right off the bat. I can guarantee you that uh, those recordings that I made, say, back in 1980, hold up perfectly well today. They sound perfectly coherent and clear, uh, and all the detail is there. And those, some of them are on cassette. That's amazing as far as I'm concerned, that those cassette recordings sound so good, because at the time I thought, man, this is utter crap. That I was very critical of my work, but in retrospect, you look back and you say, whoa, what did I do? 
that's mono. And I've turned it into stereo, and I'm doing all of these things right out of the you know, front line of the bass um, when I'm in my later teens. And that's because I had the equipment to do it on, because I had designed and built it. So I had the tools at my disposal right mm -hmm. from the very beginning. I built the best bespoke audio circuits, and at that time they were largely solid state. But I moved very quickly into entirely vacuum tube circuits because I liked the warmth of the sound and I loved the sound of the preamp. Uh, particularly with guitars, man, it sounded amazing as, as a guitar and mic preamp uh, without the Rhea Knight of Ortho EQ. Uh, it sounded really sweet. So um, I was doing a lot of work building these preamplifier circuits and selling them, of course. Uh, in various forms, sometimes as kits, but uh, as finished products for me, uh, that would really cost you a lot of money if you wanted a preamp or a power amp built by my hand. Uh, you're going to pay through the nose for that, because uh, that's quite a privilege. Uh, but as far as the other stuff goes, uh, producing those basic uh, preamplifier boards for, say, studios and stuff like that, that was easy. I had no trouble doing that for them. I just put them all into a 19-inch rack mount chassis and, you know, they could install it wherever they wanted to. Uh, but the one thing they'd get is a mic preamp and basically something that was direct wired into the mixer on their console, right? So it's going right in. Uh, it's not going through any kind of switching. It's hard wired, soldered onto that board inside the mixer, right, directly onto uh, the most pertinent uh, control point interface. And that's the way it is and was uh, when I would make a studio. The, my studio generally had a zero dB, like a noise floor way down, minus 60 or minus 70 dB, I think I was getting. Oh, which is fantastic, by the way. Uh, if you got a minus 60 or minus 70 dB noise floor, by the way, you really got nothing to worry about. I know people tell you that for digital you need like a 96 dB, but that's for that's insane. Do you know what 96 dB is? You really can't stand more than 6 or 7 dB volume changes. Is anything louder than that? And you're going to freak out your neighbors, scare the cats away, and uh, uh, possibly attract night crowds. Uh, you really don't want to play music that loud, and I used to, but I don't anymore. I stopped a long time ago and said, I've got to get something out of the low volume listening experience because I'm a committed apartment dweller and I don't want to offend my neighbors. And I say that all the time, but it's true. I don't. And it's very easily done with music, by the way. Um, you, know, you play the wrong kind of music and your neighbors are going to be really pissed off. Uh, that doesn't happen. I listen mostly to classical. Uh, they don't seem to mind. But the other thing is I listen to the really low volume, so I doubt they even hear, but I do worry about the bass, because I have a system here uh, that goes right down, and it produces very low power for the bass, and I listen to it going, <laughs> I don't want that much bass, uh, and luckily I've got the control with the junk that I'm using at the moment, and um, so I dial down the bass as much as possible, but it's still there, and it's tony, and it's taut. And the more bass you take away, the more clarity that you leave behind. And so I'm thinking to myself, you know, not only is that bass really detailed and low, but, you know, you can hear the power that is supposed to be there that you can move. But, you know, you've got the shape of the instrument so clearly delineated that uh, you're not missing anything. Hey. 